Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Engineering in Unusual Places uh, Career Exploration Webinar. Uh, my name is Thea Thar, um, and I am the Director of Programs for uh, Discover E. Can everybody hear me now? You could raise your hands and let me know that you could hear me. That'd be terrific. Oh, thank you, Bing. Appreciate that. All right. Um, I would first like to thank our sponsors, um, uh, the United Engineering Foundation and Bechtel Corporation for uh, their uh, wonderful sponsorship of today's webinar. And I would like to uh, ask our presenters to turn on their webcam so I can introduce them. You can see everyone we have joining us today. Great. All right. Joining us today for the Engineering in Unusual Places is Charlie Welch. Uh, Charlie is an aerospace engineer uh, joining us from Southern California, and he works for uh, Northrop Grumman. Next up is Mimi Irving from Houston, Texas. Uh, she works for Floor Corporation and uh, will be talking to us a little bit later. And Rachel um, is joining us from Chicago. Hi, Rachel. Um, she normally works in uh, Massachusetts, but is on business uh, in her office in Chicago for Underwriters Laboratories. All right, so without further ado, Charlie is gonna tell us about his experiences with polar bears in the Arctic. Alrighty, first off, thank you guys for having me. I'm excited to tell you guys today about our uh, cool project, building some stuff to help wildlife. So I'll just pull up the presentation really quickly. Okay, and next slide. Okay, so today, um, my name is Charlie Welch. I'm an aerospace engineer and I get to work on a really cool project at Northrop Grumman where we get to build technology to help study wildlife in a very extreme environment to help study sea ice and uh, polar bears and a few other cool stuff. Next. So the project that I work on is we scientists wanted a way to study sea ice and have a really detailed way of how sea ice is changing and how it's affecting polar bear populations. And as you can imagine, the Arctic is a very harsh environment. So they want a piece of technology to that can operate up there and help them extend their reach in studying these animals and kind of what's happening to them. Next. So our mission was basically we wanted to build a drone that could go up to the northern Arctic. So if you look at the picture in the top right hand corner, you'll see a little pin on the top and that's this little city called Churchill, Manitoba, and this is known as the polar bear capital of the world. So it's one of the largest single populations of polar bears that spend time on land and then wait for sea ice to freeze and then we'll go out on the sea ice to hunt and do you know find mates and do all that cool stuff so our job was to build something and spend um two weeks up there with seven days in the field doing behavioral monitoring and sea ice mapping with this specialty drone we'll talk about in a minute and build something that can withstand this extreme environment and uh withstand around polar bears next slide so this was our main goal. We were uh, meant to go up to study polar bears and a very, very interesting animal. Next slide. So one of the very cool things that people forget about polar bears is that they're the largest land carnivore in the world. So this is a picture of me. So I'm six feet tall and this is me standing under a life-size replica of a male polar bear. So as you can imagine, when we're spending this time up in the Arctic studying different animals, we want to make sure that we're safe, that the drone's safe, and that we can be able to take that critical science, but make sure that we can do it repeatedly and keep everyone uh, safe as we study this amazing animal. Next slide. So as part of what we did, um, Churchill's a little city, so people often ask, you know, how do you get to the Arctic? And we actually had to take a few different flights to get up to this little city of Churchill. And then we had to take a helicopter out to this cabin that was right on the edge of the sea ice so that we could get to this really critical location uh, of where the polar bears want to hang out, because that's kind of ground zero where we want to take that uh, important scientific data. Next slide. Uh, this was our team. So we had four engineers and then we had uh, two scientists from the San Diego Zoo Global. 
So the San Diego Zoo Global is one of the world leaders in wildlife research. And you know they're really the world leaders in helping to apply cutting edge technology to their conservation projects. And so uh, us four engineers, our job was to really provide them that cutting edge technology so these two scientists could uh, help to make some critical decisions about a very key iconic species. Next. So what did we build? Um, what we built was a very high tech small drone. Well, it wasn't too small, but it was designed to do two things. So the first one was the researchers wanted to be able to find a polar bear sitting on the edge of the ice. And then they wanted to be able to image ice in three dimensions using a different variety of sensors and cameras and different technologies. So what we built, we call the habitat monitoring system. So if you look on the bottom of this drone, you'll see a few different, what looks like a couple different types of cameras. So what, what these are, are visual and cameras that look in different spectrums like thermal to find different heat and temperatures and then different types of radars to help us basically create a snapshot, an image of sea ice so that if we see a polar bear sitting on the edge of the ice, we can say, you know, this is how thick the ice is and how, how what it's forming and all these different details about it. The other important thing is you'll notice the top has this kind of shell around it and the Arctic's an extremely cold environment. So we had to design this, we had to engineer this ruggedization equipment so that this drone could survive in 30 below zero temperatures, which is extremely harsh for this type of technology. So if you, uh, one of the interesting things was it was so cold, if you took your smartphone out of your pocket, it would shut down in under 30 seconds because of how extreme the cold was on the electronics. Next. So we had to take this system up there. We had to make sure everything works. And uh, as anyone as an engineer knows, there's a big difference between everything working and then you package everything up and hoping it works great. And then you have to unpack it somewhere else and hope everything works. So our first night we had to do a little troubleshooting, make sure everything was up and ready before we went out to the cabin and everything was going well so far. Excellent. Uh, we went out on the edge of the ice on this thing called a tundra buggy to try and see the landscape a little bit and get a sense of what it was gonna be like out there. So if you look at the bottom picture, it kind of looks like a hybrid between a school bus and a monster truck. And that's because there's not a lot of roads up there. So we had to kind of trek over the tundra to get to where we wanted to go. Next slide. Uh, while we were out there, we actually got to see polar bears, which was, you know, a really cool experience that, you know, you've been spending all this time uh, studying this animal and we got to see a mama and two cubs that were out there kind of hunkering down. So th they don't, they're not too uh, excited during this time. They're kind of just um, sitting down waiting for the ice to freeze. So they weren't too interested in us, but it was still cool to see them. Next slide. So the next part of this was actually getting out to the edge of the sea ice. So one of the hard parts of an engineering project like this is that if you look in that top right hand corner, uh, we had to spend 10 days in this little cabin with, you know, extremely high tech drone with every spare and part we could ever need in with very limited electricity, no running water and making sure that we could still deploy the drone to get scientific data. So it was our first kind of entrance to what it was going to be like spending 10 days out there. And we had to get dropped off by helicopter. So if we needed a spare part, it wasn't like we could just ask for one or go back to, you know, town and get something we needed. Next slide. Uh, just some pictures from inside. So obviously one of the very cool parts about an engineering project like this is it's very much an adventure. So, you, you know, you, to go from a cubicle to a cabin like this is definitely a big juxtaposition of a normal day. Next. So from the cabin, we would go out, we'd hike out to the edge of the ice. So you kind of see us all standing around there on the drone, getting ready to send it out. So we would go right to the edge of where the ice is freezing and then send the drone out even farther. So that could go a few miles away from us um, over kind of that critical ice area where ice is just starting to freeze and where polar bears are gonna hang out and start to take some scientific information. Next slide. Uh, just an example of it flying. So you kind of see us all bundled up there in the bottom uh, right hand corner and then you see the drone taking off or uh, to go off on a mission. One of the other important things is to think about is our pilot actually has to fly. Um, well, it's an autonomous drone. So it technically will fly its whole mission itself, but we have to have a pilot, you know, holding a controller for safety, but it was so cold. We actually had to package 
the entire controller around his body in this thermal shell so that he could keep his hands uh, warm enough while he was trying to control the sticks. Next slide. Uh, just an example of some kind of ice formation. So you can see the drone up there taking different pictures using all those different cameras and trying to hopefully spot some polar bears. Next. Uh, just a little bit about transporting. So we had to, uh, you know, get all of our gear out right to the edge of the ice, which, you know, and those temperatures are difficult to do. So sometimes we had to walk it all the way out there. Some, uh, one of the days we had an ATV we were, that we got running we could use, but, you know, lots of logistical engineering challenges to focus on, which were uh, fun to say the least. Next. And overall, over those 10 days, uh, we had seven mission days. We had two, we had three down days because of weather. So we had, you know, 50, 60 mile an hour winds where we couldn't technically fly anything. But from the seven days we had, we flew uh, seven out of those seven days successfully and, you know, 25, 30 below zero. And we had 14 successful missions on that day, which will show some cool scientific data that we got to take. And uh, we were really excited about being able to offer a piece of, you know, really high technology that's aiding in these conservation efforts that these scientists are really trying to help understand to make some important decisions about these wildlife species. Next. And this is just an example of uh, the kind of data we took. So as I was saying, we're trying to study right as ice is forming. So if you look at the right side of this picture, you'll see what kind of looks like a dark river and that's ice that's just freezing. So we want to basically create a map. So what the drone does is flies over this whole area and takes a series of lots of different pictures. And then we use uh, a software to combine all these pictures into a big map that we can look at in 3D and say how thick the ice is and what the formation looks like and whether there's any interesting features. So if you look at the bottom left, we even tried to see if we could spot what would be a simulated kill site of a polar bear hunting a seal. So if you look, there's little red dots on the ice, which uh, the very high resolution camera was able to pick up these small changes in the color of the ice so we could try and see if we could spot a, a hunting site. Next slide. And again, so one of the other things our drone does is not only take pictures in the visual, kind of like your eye sees, but we take pictures in what's called multi-spectral. So it's almost like predator vision, where you can look at things in a thermal gradient to try and pick out different features. So it might be a little bit difficult to see, but if you look at the top right-hand picture on the bottom right, that looks like yellow and purplish kind of color. So that's a thermal picture. So it's showing us different heat temperatures of the ice. And if you can look closely, you actually can see our footsteps as we're walking through the snow. So the, the camera is actually able to pick up the temperature difference between a footstep in the snow and a normal snow next to it. So it could help us to track the paths of different wildlife. Next slide. Uh, can you go uh, two more slides, I think, actually. So this was kind of our goal. So you see a polar bear sitting here right there and right here you're like okay that's definitely a polar bear but uh, if you can go back one slide so as you kind of go farther out you'll see this polar bear right in the middle there is sitting on the edge of the ice as the ice is starting to freeze so they can go out and hunt so one of the really interesting facts about polar bears is that they don't eat for almost half the year almost four to five months they don't have a single meal so when the ice starts to freeze is when they're waiting to actually go out and eat. And so they're very anxious for the ice to go out. And this was a data um, we're hoping to take a snapshot of is how this ice is freezing and how these polar bears are really interacting with it in a way that is difficult to uh, normally study. But using this new technology, we're able to get a different perspective of the polar bear's environment. Next, or a couple, two slides. And overall, it was a big successful mission. Uh, that's a picture of me uh, with a beard. You know, you gotta get ready for the cold environment. So thankfully I can shave it when I got back, but we're really excited to have uh, operated an environment like that and had everything come back successful and safe and have everyone back and be excited to work with that scientific team. Next slide. And then lastly, one of the other cool things you get to see because you're, so, you're um, so high in latitude is 
you get to see the auroras. So the auroras are these charged particles coming from the sun that interact with the Earth's magnetic field and create these kind of bright green lights in the skies and give you some really interesting sunsets. And uh, it's very uh, cool to see if you ever get to a chance to go that high up. Next slide. And that's it. So hopefully you guys got to learn a little bit about a different engineering job. So as I said, I'm an aerospace engineer and I worked on kind of applying aerospace technology to a different application. And for people watching, you know, there's lots of different cool jobs you can do where you can do things in conservation or in environmental studies. And you know, there's lots of ways we can work to bring technology to conserve things on the earth. So if it's something you're interested in, there's a lot of great projects to out there and you get to go a lot of cool places. I think that's it. Thanks, Charlie. That was terrific. Really uh, enjoyed that uh, presentation. And while you were talking, um, there were lots of folks sharing where they're from, whether they were from Massachusetts or where, where I'm located, or if they were from Michigan and Florida. We got people from all over the U.S. Oh, um, cool. Uh, while we're waiting for Mimi to join us now uh, to do her presentation, um, just, uh, just before Mimi comes on, I'd love to know uh, in, the, in the question box if you could just say whether or not you're watching this with your students or if you'll be presenting this to your students later. We'd just love to, love to hear that. All right, so Charlie and I are going to step off while Mimi talks to you about STEM style. Hello, everyone. I'm so excited to be here. Um, to share my engineering background um, in creative spaces. So next slide. So how many of you would think that an engineer can be fashionable, can be a pro athlete, can win pageants, all while designing electrical substations and working on one of the largest projects in the world in Kazakhstan? Well, that's me. I was born in Japan. I am, as you can see, a project engineer now on the TCO project, which is in Kazakhstan. And these are some of the things that I've done throughout right now. Next slide. So um, I work at Floor, and Floor has given me the ultimate foundation um, in my career right now. Um, I have been able to have many, many opportunities um, within the company. Now, who is Floor? Well, I'm glad you asked. We are a company that build complex projects across the world. Um, some of our clients are BP, Exxon, Shell, and we turn their ideas into reality. And we also give back to the community as well. Next slide. So let's get into my story. Now I'm a real girly girl, as you can see, um, but sometimes engineers have to work in dangerous locations and, in, and environments. Um, but we also have to protect ourselves when we're in these areas with PPE, and that stands for Personal Protective Equipment. Now, it's not always the most fashionable, but it's there to protect you for safety. Um, and it definitely doesn't stop me from wearing my lipstick. My hard hat, you see, next slide, sometimes will get tilted to the side, but only because of my hair. But I promise it was there all on all the time. So the project that this was um, located in was in El Dorado, Arkansas, very small town. So my team and I, we designed, you can see that second picture, a two-story substation that powered different units within the facility. It was a rather old, um, uh, old unit and refinery, and they were upgrading their refinery to get more barrels of oil produced. Next slide. So now my next adventure. Now, I was able to be a part of history in this um, role that I was in. It was actually during the BP oil spill um, back in 2010. It was the industrial biggest disaster on April 20th. Um, it happened in the Gulf of Mexico, and it was very, very um, traumatic. Um, if you haven't heard about it, be sure to ask your teachers to tell you more about it. Um, Floor, what Floor did was they put together a team, immediate team, to help with the recovery um, and cleanup committee out there. Next slide. So the oil on these beaches covered about thousands of square miles of oil. So if you've ever been to Florida, Alabama, or Mississippi, they had oil on these beaches. 
So I was asked to help lead the protection for wildlife out there, specifically the turtles. Now it was during their nesting season. So we had to be very, very careful when we were cleaning up the beaches, especially at night, because that's when the nesting eggs would, would release and the turtles would try to get to the feet. I had no idea about turtles, but I had to train and manage over 300 individuals for teams to go out at night to help protect against the big machinery that you see up there cleaning the beaches. It was a huge effort. As an engineer, you have to be able to be adaptable and learn real quick. The turtle, or I wouldn't say, I was called the turtle queen on this particular incident, um, or uh, like I said, excursion that I had. So even in a traumatic situation, uh, we were able to give back by saving the wildlife. Next slide. So now we're traveling, traveling a little bit more. I'm still in my lipstick, and now I can actually wear a little bit more fashionable clothing. Um, I was able to um, travel across the pond and work in Europe as a sales coordinator. And I was there supporting sales leads, which are individuals that help us win work for like clients such as Shell, Exxon, or BP that I spoke of before. These individuals or the sales leads was located in Australia, the Middle East, and I helped supported them with proposal work. So all in all, next slide. You'll see even through these different opportunities, we were able to convince and also talk to the different clients worldwide. We were even able to ride some camels there, a lot of fun, but at the end of the day, we were still being able to work and win our work there over in Doha. Next slide. So would you have thought engineers can do all this? I mean, talking about it, I'm a little bit out of breath myself. So I want to talk about how we mix this or how I mix this with what I'm doing as well with fashion. How does engineering or having a STEM background mix? So I'll tell you how. Science, and I'm going to break it down from STEM, S-T-E-M, STEM. So science, as you know, a lot of fabrics are dealing with what we're wearing. And also with yoga material, you will see that they use different materials called nano whiskers. So as you know, a designer or anyone working with fabric, you have to be cognizant about the different science and makeup that are actually going into materials. Well, that's the same thing with engineering. We have PPE, like I said earlier, earlier that helps protect our skin against different flammable materials and also chemicals. Next slide. The technology. So fashion, and we're using a lot of 3D, a lot of technology, a lot of cutting to, for your patterns, as you can see here. And me, as I said, as a turtle queen, there was different huge um, equipment that was used to clean the beach. So being cognizant of the different technology that was used out there in order to protect the turtles was well needed. Next slide. Engineering. So as an engineer, we're able to share and give back to individuals such as yourself and teach and be able to communicate how engineering is used. So as an international sales coordinator, I was able to do that with helping the sales lead, not only with having the engineering background, but helping from the aspect of us communicating with some of our clients that may not be very much aware of what it is we do as a company. Next slide. So math, yes, in the fashion industry, you have to be able to know your math and your measurement. Boy, for boys and girls, we have to understand the sizing. And there are so many different metrics used. You have your US, you have, you know, your European sizes. So no matter what field it is you're going into, whether it's engineering, whether it's accounting, whether it's fashion, you need math. Next slide. So why is STEM so important? Well, it's, it's been said that even having a STEM with a STEM background, the employability is much higher than not having a STEM background. Next slide. So like I said, some of these individuals here 
actually have a STEM background. Did you know? Did you know Barbie? Barbie is even having a STEM background. But look at this, Ashton Kusher. Ashton Kusher has a biochemical engineering background. How amazing is that? We have also stated, looking there, we have Contina Ben, who also, she works for Northrop Grumman, and she is an industrial engineer, and she has her own baking business. We have Miss USA, Karen McCullough from 2017, who now works at a nuclear regulatory center. Then you have Cindy Crawford, who is a chemical engineer by degree and who is a top fashion model. And I don't know if you guys are familiar with Beavis and Butthead, but you have Mike Judge. He is the creator of that and he has a physics degree. Next slide. So the question is, do you have STEM style? Next slide. I thank you. And I want to let you know that it's always, you can always have your own individual aspect in any career that you have. We're continuously encouraging youth and, and you know, to go into the STEM background and, and go into, you know, having your own creativity while doing it because creativity also turns ideas into reality. Thank you. Hey, Mimi, that was terrific. Thank you <laughs> so much. I um, am always inspired to think about my own STEM style whenever I talk to you um, <laughs> and uh, really enjoyed your presentation. We uh, got a couple of Thank great you. questions. Um, in the question box, which we'll get to later. So if anyone has questions for either um, uh, uh, Mimi or Charlie so far, put them in the question box. I'm marking them down, and we'll get to them at the end. So Thank now, you. I, uh, bye. Now we're going to welcome Rachel. Uh, Rachel, if you could turn on your webcam, I made you the presenter. Um, so next up is Rachel. Uh, take it away. All right. Hey, everybody. Um, unfortunately, today I don't have any cool animals to show you, no polar bears, no turtles, um, but I'm very excited to share with you about what I do, which is called human factors engineering. So who am I? Um, so again, my name is Rachel Aronchik, and I am a managing human factor specialist at a company called UL Wickland. Um, and I study human factors engineering, which I'll tell you all about at Tufts University, which is a college that's located right there at that red pin, right outside of Boston, Massachusetts. So what is human factors engineering? I'll give you a couple of examples first. So let's say that you see this picture of a door, or you walk up to a door that looks like this. How would you expect to open this door? So do you think that you would push it, or do you think that you would pull it? Well, even though those handles there make it seem as though you would pull this door, this is actually a door that you should push. I'm sure that this has happened to you before where you've walked up to a door and you've tried to pull it and it didn't come or it didn't open and then you had to push it instead. And you might have felt a little bit stupid or a little silly when you did that, but you shouldn't feel that way. This is actually an example of where applying human factors engineering um, would make this design better. Um, so right now this is poor design because the, design, the door is designed in a way that makes you think that you should pull it even though you actually should push it. A better design after applying human factors and engineering might be this door on the right. Um, in this door, it's very clear that you need to, to push that to open it, and there's really no way that you would be able to open that door. I'll give you another example. Does anybody know what this is? So you can think about that for a second, um, but for those of you who don't know, this is actually what can openers used to look like but I think that you could see a lot of issues with the design of this can opener. Um, so first, uh, it's missing something that you commonly see, which is that lever that you turn. Um, and so this can opener requires that you have a lot of strength in order to open the can. It also has a lot of sharp, sharp edges and corners, which could be really dangerous and lead somebody to hurt themselves. So by applying human factors engineering, you can think of all, all of the ways that you can make this can opener better, safer, easy to use, more fun to use, and you can have a can opener that looks like this. Um, this one is much more comfortable to hold. It has that turn lever that I talked about that requires less strength for you. Um, it doesn't have any sharp edges on it anymore. And it actually looks really nice. 
Um, so that's an example of applying what we call human factors engineering to make products easier and safer for people to use based on people's capabilities and based on the way that people think and interact with things around them. I'll give you one more example. This slide doesn't have any pictures on it because we'll actually do a speaking exercise. So wherever you are with your classmates and with your teachers, in just a moment, I'd like you to um, spell the word shop three times out loud. So ready? S-H-O-P, S-H-O-P, S-H-O-P. Now, what do you do at a green light? For those of you who said stop, I don't know about you, but in Boston, Massachusetts, we actually go at green lights. So I tricked you there. In that case, even though there was absolutely nothing wrong with the design of my question, there was something wrong or there was something about the context that I gave you that question in that led you to say stop instead of go. So human factors engineering, a lot of that is also thinking about the context in which somebody performs an action and considering how the context, so the fact that I asked you to spell shop might accidentally lead you to make a mistake without even realizing that you had done so. So in all of these examples that I just showed you, if something does something wrong, Remember that you shouldn't feel stupid about it. You shouldn't feel silly. Instead, there might have been something that was wrong with the design of the product that made it more difficult to use or made you accidentally make a mistake when in turn, um, it actually wasn't really your fault and there might be better ways to design it. So what we always say in human factors engineering is don't blame the user, instead blame the product. And so now I wanna talk a little bit about how this applies to medical devices. So for all of the products that we just talked about, for example, with a can opener or with the, um, the door that you accidentally push or instead of pull, it's not a big deal if you try to do that. You might just feel a little bit silly. But when you think about the same thing with medical devices, now it's really important that they're designed so that people can use them easily and safely. Um, for example, I'm sure that you might have a friend or maybe a sibling who has asthma. Um, I, it's very important that somebody can use that inhaler correctly to help somebody if they're having trouble breathing. Or for example, with the product on the right, I bet a lot of you might have friends, classmates, or maybe even you yourself who has a severe allergy to bees or to peanuts. Um, if you couldn't figure out how to use that EpiPen to make your friend feel better, that would be very unsafe. And so what my company does is we work with companies that make these EpiPens or make the inhalers any types of medical devices to help them test them and design them so that they are both safer and easier for you, um, easier to use for people. All right, so oops, I think my slides just went back. All right, so as you might expect, developing a product from scratch is a long process that requires a lot of different people. Um, and so what you see here is the engineering design process which starts with figuring out what the problem is or um, what the need is. Then you need to research and understand the problem and think about potential solutions. And then once you think about a solution, you need to start building it. And so where my company sits in is right here in the test and improve stages. So sort of toward the end of the design process. Um, and for most of the projects that we work on, the company or the client comes to us already with a product in hand and they say, Here's this product, help us make it better. I just want to introduce you to a day in my life. Um, first of all, the thing, first thing that I want to point out is that in a lot of the pictures I'll show you, you'll see that faces are blurred. The reason that we do that is just to respect the privacy of the people that are in these pictures. But one of the things that we do a lot of at our company and that are shown in these pictures is what we call usability test. And what a usability test is, is when somebody comes in so let's say somebody has asthma and uses an inhaler, we would have that person come in and provide their feedback about a new inhaler that is being developed. We would get their feedback about what they like, what they don't like, what things they think are easy and what things they think are difficult. Um, we also want to see them use the inhaler and see if they make mistakes when using it. And that way we can try to understand how we might be able to change the inhaler, um, just like we changed the handle on that door, to make it so that it's much easier to use uh, and much more easy to understand rather than um, having it be more difficult or maybe even unsafe. So on the left, you see a picture of me working with a child and her mom um, to get feedback on a new inhaler that is in development to treat asthma. And on the right is a picture of me working with a nurse, actually, 
um, who is evaluating a product that sticks onto your body to help deliver medicine. A lot of times, like in both of these cases, we want a big research room where there's a big table, there's a place for users to interact with the product and also to provide their feedback. But sometimes we also go to different environments. So when running usability tests of hospital, hospital equipment, for example, it's important that we evaluate it in the context that we will be using it in. Just like I gave you that shop stop example, we want to see if there's anything in the environment that might lead them to use the product differently than they would. And so the picture on the left is actually in a simulated hospital room where we were evaluating a hospital product. And on the right is a picture of what we call a focus group. This is actually sort of like a usability test, but instead of it just being one person who comes in at a time, we have a big group of people come in together. And the benefit of this is that it's more of a discussion. They can bounce ideas off each other. Um, they can understand what the group of them like and what they don't like and so forth. And then when we're done with the project, when we have all all of these people come in and we get their feedback. The next step for my company is to summarize all of that feedback in a report. And the report describes what we observed, what we learned, um, and sometimes we also include recommendations for the company for how to redesign their product to align with the participants' feedback and also to make the product safer and easier. And this is all um, part of human factors engineering. Then the company takes all of the feedback and all of the changes that we suggest they might implement and they might um, follow those suggestions and make that feedback, and then they run another test. And the purpose of that second test or that third or fourth test is to see if the changes that they made were actually effective. Um, it's probably similar to what you do in school where you might submit a draft of a paper to your teacher and then they review it and they give you feedback and they make it better. Um, ultimately, what we're trying to do is get to the best product or in your case, the best paper as possible. And so as you can see in these photos, we work with a ton of different types of people, including the client, so the company that's making the product, all of the participants that come in, people on our team, and things like that. And as I mentioned, a lot of times we conduct these um, either in our office at a research facility or in another place near Boston. But sometimes we also have to travel to other cities around the United States to meet with different types of people that might not be available in the Boston area. So this green flag is where my office is in Concord, Massachusetts, right outside of Boston. But to conduct usability tests, I've also gone to New York, Minneapolis, Seattle, Detroit, Miami, San Francisco, Chicago, where I am right now, and Baltimore. So it seems pretty cool. I've gotten to see a lot of the United States, but I've also gotten to travel around the world. Um, so for work, I've been to London, I've been to Buenos Aires in Argentina, I've been to Tokyo in Japan, I went to the Netherlands, and I had a quick stopover in Australia. So I've gotten to do some really cool travel and gotten to see pretty much all parts of the world. And so far, I've given you examples of somewhat simple devices. So, so there's not a lot of buttons, not a lot of interactions, an inhaler seems pretty simple, especially if you've used one before. But it's important to apply human factors everywhere. So for example, there are now these robots that actually perform surgeries. And so what you see in the picture on the right is the surgeon is sitting at that video game like console and he's controlling little handles or little joysticks with his hands looking at a video screen and then the robot on the right all of those arms will move and actually perform the surgery so it's really really cool technology um, but it's just as important for that robotic surgical system to be as safe as an inhaler is uh, additionally as you can see human factors engineering is not only for products that people like you and me use at home. Um, instead, it's also for products that are used by doctors or nurses or caregivers or your parents. And so by applying human factors engineering to all of these different types of products that help all different types of people, um, we are helping everybody. So we're helping everyone from babies to kids to adults to grandparents and even making life easier for the doctors and healthcare professionals that are helping you out as well. So that's all I have to share on human factors engineering, and I uh, hope you guys enjoyed the presentation. Very much, Rachel. And I'm going to mm -hmm. ask um, Charlie and Mimi to turn on their webcams, and uh, I'm going to keep myself on uh, just audio for now, and I'm going to ask a couple questions. Um, so, all right. Uh, the first question I have came in, Mimi, while you were uh, chatting. Someone wanted to know how does travel 
How do you think travel has affected your lifestyle? And Rachel, you can probably chime in on that too. <laughs> well, uh, okay. So for me, I've always traveled. My parents were in the military. I was born overseas. So traveling was all that I, I've known. So being able to move, you know, quickly and adapt is, is quite familiar for me. So it, it hasn't affected me. It's, it's been positive for me. Yeah, and I would agree, um, but I actually don't did not have that much experience traveling uh, as Mimi did. Um, so it's only been positive. I've gotten to see really awesome places. Um, as you saw, I sort of took a trip around the world. So when I went to Tokyo, Sydney, and Argentina, that was all on the same trip. Um, so I got to really, truly go around the world, um, which I wouldn't have been able to do otherwise. All right, Charlie, this is a very technical question from Keaton. Wants to know, how many polar bears did you see? Oh, Charlie, you're muted. <laughs> that is very true. I am muted. <laughs> so the first time we went up, we saw about 15 of them. Uh, it, was, it was a really good day. And then the second time we went up to the Arctic, we saw about five in a single day. Wow. And a follow-up question was, did anything bad happen to you while traveling in the Arctic? Uh, I wouldn't say bad, but uh, one, the only hiccup we really had was, so we had to fly out all of our water with us on the helicopter, and we actually ran out of water the exact day we were supposed to leave. So it's kind of a cutting it close, I guess you could say. Yeah, I would be surprised if the water wasn't iced <laughs> for most of the time. Um, I have a question for each of you. It's come in um, for uh, for everybody. Is how did you get involved or interested in the various fields you're in? So Rachel, we're going to start. We're going to go backwards. We'll go to Rachel, then we'll go to Mimi, Charlie. Just how did you get involved, and um, what kind of path led you to engineering? Sure. So I was always very involved and interested in math. Uh, math was always one of the things that I loved. And when I got to college, I took a math class and I said, you know what, this isn't for me. And so I started talking to a couple of people and they told me about human factors engineering. Um, and actually the example that they gave me, which might seem a little bit outdated today, but they said, think about a GPS. So before you had Google Maps on your smartphone, um, they said, think about a GPS and you have to design that GPS in a way that it's really easy for people to understand when the majority of their attention has to be on the road. So do you tell somebody to make a right on a certain street or to make a right after the school or to make the second right? How do you communicate that information to somebody in a way that they can understand? Um, and I said, wow, that sounds fascinating. And they said, well, that's human factors engineering. Um, and so I just took some classes in it and, and fell in love with it really instantly. Um, but it's definitely a very small field. So there aren't a lot of colleges in the country that have that degree. Um, so I was really lucky to stumble upon it. All right, Mimi, if you could uh, say, why did you choose electrical engineering and not fashion? <laughs> I, I know that is a very, I ask myself that sometimes too. But um, for me, I uh, it started when I was a little girl. I was at my grandmother's house. It was, she, she lived in a, a rather old older home. And I would definitely, this is not recommending to anyone, but I was so curious that I stuck a bobby pin in an outlet and I got electrocuted. And thank God, you know, nothing uh, happened seriously, but my, my fingertips were, were burned. And I, although I was little, that stuck in with me and I was curious on why did that happen? You know, how does electricity work? And so going into my major, I automatically knew that I wanted to um, go into electrical engineering. Now, although I'm not into, in the technical field now, um, I'm more into the project management. Um, fashion has always been in parallel with that. But given when I was in school and coming up, we didn't have the internet and all the um, you know, outlets and accessibility to see all that. So I didn't have anyone to really tell me, oh, you can go into fashion. I just know I loved it, but I didn't, I didn't realize that I can actually do a career because it was always taught to me that go into something, whether you're a doctor, lawyer, engineer, or what have you. So that's how engineering became the forefront. All right, Charlie. 
How did you get involved in aerospace? Uh, for, for me, it was, you know, very similar as a kid growing up, you know, you're kind of a natural explorer. You're kind of fascinated with things that are weird and wiggly and bugs and all this other stuff. And for me, aerospace became like the ultimate field of exploration where, you know, people can fly to different parts of the earth and, you know, fly into outer space. And it's about, you know, spending all this energy learning about how we build things and how those things we build teach us about the world around us. And even now, like, you know, you, you never expect that building airplanes would help you study, you know, a 12 foot Arctic bear. So it's uh, been a lifelong journey that it's been pretty exciting to be a part of. And I think it's just kind of caring, just trying to stay a little kid as long as possible. I love that. They, look, Mimi got shocked into it. Rachel kind of stumbled into it and you're like, woo, let's stay curious. It's awesome. <laughs> um, Rachel, I have uh, two questions for you. Um, I was asked, uh, as a human factors engineer, do you create product designs or just the concept? So a little bit of both. It actually, um, it depends on what our client needs from us. Um, so for the most part, we are helping with um, the designs once the product already exists. Um, but we are starting to do a lot more actually from scratch where we can do what we call 3D prototyping. You can draw out different concepts or maybe make it into um, a program that enables you to make 3D objects. And then using 3D printing technology, we can also help print those too. Uh, so it really depends on what our what companies need our help with, but we can do it all. Great. Um, thank you. Uh, as a follow-up question, as a human factors engineer, is it just for medical devices, or do you do you uh, do do you work in other fields? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, human factors engineering can apply to anything. So it can apply to medical, as you've seen, which is what I focus in. But it also applies to cars. Um, it can ap apply to aviation. So how do you design a an airplane cockpit so that all of the buttons are easy to find and so that somebody can land a, a plane safely? Um, it also applies to really cool consumer products like all of your iPhones and your Apple Watches and the iPads. All of that has human factors engineering that goes into it to make sure that everybody can use the products easily and enjoy them. Um, but also other consumer products, maybe like stoves or fancy vacuums, um, Swiffer mops, all of those things have human factors engineering that goes into them to make the product the safest and easiest that it can be. Thank you. All right, Charlie, how did you prepare for the cold? So that's a good question. It's hard to simulate the Arctic in sunny Southern California. So uh, our company builds telescopes and satellites. So we actually took all of our equipment and put it in this giant chamber meant to simulate deep space. And we'd take it down to Arctic temperatures and see what it was actually like up there. Yikes, I wouldn't want to accidentally get locked into that room. <laughs> <laughs> wouldn't do so well there. Um, uh, all right. Uh, um, so next question, Mimi, is for you. And what kind of clothes do you design? Well, I do. I specifically design bow ties, which is an accessory, obviously, since you here. Well, here. Um, but I sell vintage resale. So vintage is what I look for and sell, but I actually design and make the bow ties. Oh, cool. That's awesome. All right. Well, I think we're about out of time, and I want to thank our three presenters today. Um, you guys are really engineering in unusual places and doing all kinds of wonderful things to make the world a better place, and we appreciate uh, it so much. Um, and I just want to say to the folks, um, if you have more questions about what's involved in engineering or how you can get, in, um, how you can continue to explore engineering, we invite you to come to our website, discovere.org, and go click on the Discover section. And there you'll see um, reasons to love engineering, career outlook, um, all of the different types of engineering, electrical, aerospace. Human factors, it's all there with different kinds of jobs um, that you can do in those fields. So again, uh, thank you to our wonderful uh, presenters uh, this morning, or this afternoon, oh my goodness. 
lost a whole day. Um, and uh, thank you all for joining us um, and uh, for sharing this with your students. Uh, so have a great afternoon, everyone, and uh, uh, thank you, presenters. Thank you. Thank you.